Hey, welcome everyone. It's good to see you all and to be back at the Bible College. Last week I was uh, teaching from home, so good to be here with you all. Um, let's just begin with a word of prayer and then uh, we'll talk through some of the, the things, uh, assignments and things like that uh, before we go into today's passage. Uh, would someone be willing to open us in prayer, please? Yeah, we want to thank you for this time. Thank you for um, your presence, your grace upon us this morning. We ask, oh God, that you would minister to us this morning as we begin to learn from your word. We ask for your grace and bless each one of us, God, with your power, with your glory. Help, help us to live a life which is pleasing before your eyes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. So um, I think your first assignment, your reflection paper was due uh, last week. Um, I haven't looked at how many people turned it in, and uh, but if you haven't yet turned it in, please do that. Um, were there any questions anyone had or? No, okay. Um, the other thing is that I posted two videos um, or um, I didn't post it. Monica, who helps with the classroom, posted two videos uh, last week. So these were the two videos just to make up because we had missed one class um, a few weeks ago. So please watch those videos because today we're going to be continuing uh, from past those videos. I did the end of First Corinthians and then uh, Second Corinthians, just the introduction and chapter one and two. So today we'll continue from chapter three. Um, so you all can go back and watch those videos if you haven't yet seen it. Um, yeah, so we can go into um, Second Corinthians. Uh, did anyone have anything else with assignments? Uh, if you have started on your final assignment, any questions, anything before we do? Okay, uh, feel free to reach out to me during the week. I, I'll try and keep an eye on my on Google Classroom. I'll know if somebody posts, but uh, if you all are emailing me or something, I'll just uh, look out for that in case you'll have any questions and need help uh, as you all are doing it or preparing to do the assignment. So we'll go into uh, chapter three of Second Corinthians. But before that, let me just give you a brief uh, background to Second Corinthians. I've done it in the video, but in case you missed it uh, or you haven't yet seen it, uh, just so that you have some context to what is going on here. So um, Second Corinthians was written about three years after First Corinthians. And um, so the, the letter, uh, to the Corinthians, that first letter that we have uh, in the Bible was written in response to some things that Paul had heard about the church, things that were going on in the church um, from reports that he'd received uh, from within the church and possibly Titus, who had also visited the Corinthian church, had gone back and uh, met Paul and shared some of these things. And so uh, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians as a resp just to answer some of the questions, to address some of the issues that were there. Now, 2 Corinthians is quite different. Um, it uh, mostly is uh, Paul's self-defense. Uh, so it seems that there were uh, there was a continue continuation of that tension between um, a leader, church leaders. So uh, there were people who had come in who were uh, mocking Paul in some way. Uh, we'll see a little more in detail about that in Second Corinthians chapter eleven, where he talks more directly about it. But um, 
so there were some people who were claiming to be uh, greater apostles or leaders than Paul. And they had come into the church and they were uh, kind of trying to uh, teach the church certain new things. Um, and so that was a confusion within the church of who should, um, is Paul really somebody that they can, uh, is he someone who has the authority uh, of a leader that they can trust? And so Paul is sort of writing a defense um, about his own uh, his own role as an apostle. And um, also it is that continuation of uh, the um, the tension between the elite within the church uh, wanting a leader who meets their standards of rhetoric, who uh, meets their standards of being someone that they uh, support financially, whereas Paul was not receiving financial support from them. Uh, so all of these things uh, created some tension between Paul as the uh, as a someone as someone who had authority within the Corinthian church as a leader there and so he's writing this letter to uh, support or to defend himself uh, so we'll see a lot of things where he's talking about uh, writing a letter of recommendation um, being somebody who can be trusted for what uh, for the work that he has done uh, especially today what we look at in chapter three, uh, we'll talk a lot about that. So with that, we can go into chapter three. Um, would someone be willing to just read the entire chapter for us? It's not a very long chapter. Second Corinthians chapter three. Do we begin again to commend ourselves or do we need, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not as tablets of stone, but on tablets not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart, the spirit, not the letter. And we have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient. <laughs> who has also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Glory of the new covenant. But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect, because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses, who put a veil on his over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is fed, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, 
just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, sister. So, um, so we see here Paul um, beginning with this thought of do we have to start from the beginning again? So when Paul first went to the Corinthians, they didn't know him. And so um, he had to win their trust or he had to build their trust uh, in who he was. So uh, in verse 1, he's saying, do we begin again now to commend ourselves to you? Should we again uh, now try and prove who we are to you? Um, or should we have somebody else write a letter? So we see that uh, even in scriptures where uh, Paul will write a small um, just a small recommendation for the person who's taking the letter or someone who is going to the church on his behalf. He writes that on behalf of uh, Timothy, on behalf of Titus. Uh, so similarly, uh, this was something that was common, uh, a common practice where uh, a leader, a church leader or minister would have somebody write on their behalf just so that the people that they were going to uh, would be able to trust trust them because they've got a, a recommendation from somebody they know or they, they've got a recommendation from someone they trust uh, and so he's saying should we ourselves now have a letter like that that we give to you uh, from somebody else or uh, or should we ask you yourselves for a letter and then uh, in verse 2 he says but you are our letter uh, written on our hearts known and read by all men and so um, he says, when people look at you, when they see the fruit uh, that has been born in this church, uh, that is the proof of the work that we did. Uh, proof that the work we did was uh, work that truly was of the spirit, was of God. Um, and, and it's proof to everyone, right? Because everyone can see your lives. Everyone can see the church, what's going on in the church. Uh, so just by seeing the fruit of the work, uh, they can tell that our work was uh, work that was genuine. Um, and that's a beautiful thing, uh, just as, uh, as people who are serving the Lord, uh, to think about that, that when we are ministering to people, uh, their lives, how they are impacted, uh, will... Um, will be proof that God has worked through us. And other people will also be able to see that work and know uh, that God himself has done this. Um, God has used us, uh, but it's God himself who has done it. Um, something for us to kind of uh, look at in the work that we are doing, uh, to look at the lives of the people we are serving and see what is the impact it's having on their lives. Uh, do we see that, uh, that kind of spiritual growth? Do we see um, maturity in their walk with Christ? Uh, all of those things. Is, is that um, happening in their lives? And if so, then that is the evidence that what we've been doing um, is, really, uh, is really in line with God and in line with his spirit. Uh, so then in verse 3, uh, clearly you are an epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh. Uh, so we, uh, this language is very familiar because um, it's it's uh, use of images from scripture itself, right? Uh, where we hear in the Old Testament uh, that the law would no longer be written on uh, on stone, on tablets of stone, but would be written on people's hearts when uh, when the Holy Spirit came, when people uh, encountered Jesus. So uh, we'll just look at um, some of those passages. Uh, if someone can read Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, 
when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So uh, we see here um, Paul using that. We see the same uh, language used in other parts of the Old Testament as well in Ezekiel 11, 19, and 20, in Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27, uh, talking about removing the heart of stone of the people and uh, God removing the heart of stone uh, that people had and giving them a heart of flesh uh, through the Holy Spirit. Uh, so uh, Paul is intentionally using this language because from here on, he shifts to talking about the old covenant versus the new covenant. Um, and in doing that, he's uh, why is he doing that? Is because he's saying that I am an apostle of a covenant that is much greater than uh, the covenant that was given through Moses. Okay, so uh, uh, these um, many of the people in the church were from a Jewish background and they had a great reverence for Moses uh, because of his leadership of the people of Israel um, and the fact that that covenant was established between God and Israel uh, through Moses, through Moses's leadership. And so um, here Paul is saying that um, the the covenant that I have brought to you is greater than that covenant that Moses brought to you. And so if you give Moses that kind of uh, reverence, uh, then recognize that I am also worthy of, uh, of respect, uh, not because of my authority, but because of the glory of the covenant that uh, God has allowed me to bring to you, to share with you. Um, so so here in verse 3, he um, basically is saying um, that work that was promised in the Old Testament of uh, the heart being transformed, right? So, so moving from the letter of the law to moving to a heart of flesh which carries the um, truth of God, which carries the law of God in your heart, uh, that was what happened for you as a church, for y'all, uh, as people who receive the gospel. And so that itself is evidence of the work that we did. Um, so then from there, verses 4 to 6, and we have such trust through Christ toward God. Um, so th this confidence that they have is through Christ. It's not uh, in themselves in what they did, uh, but it is because of what Jesus did uh, and what Jesus has done in the lives of the church. And then uh, verse 5, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. Uh, so he's making it clear here, even though I'm talking about myself and I'm talking about my um, I'm trying to defend my role as the leader here. Uh, I want you to recognize that it's only because of God uh, that that position that I have, the uh, work that has been accomplished, everything has been only through God. Uh, so that in no way is he trying to take glory for what has been accomplished. Um, and here the word sufficiency uh, means the ability or the competency. So uh, the ability for him to have uh, 
seen that church transform, those people transformed, or the competency to carry the gospel to them, all was from God and not from himself. Um, so uh, this is something for us also to remember that um, in ministry, we are often called to things that are much, much greater than anything we can accomplish in our own strength. And our sufficiency, our strength, our ability, uh, our competency, whether we uh, have the knowledge or the skills or all of that is secondary. It's definitely important to uh, work on those things and to grow in those things. but. Uh, what is important is the calling and our obedience to the calling and then trusting in God to give us uh, the the understanding, the skills that we need to carry out what he has called us to and to give him the glory when we see that happen as well. Um, verse 6, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Um, so uh, he made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. A minister is somebody uh, who serves, uh, who runs errands for a master. Uh, so uh, it's also understood as someone who picks up dust. So uh, they are sent, they run to do the task that has been entrusted to them. And so uh, that was the understanding of what Paul was called to. He was just carrying out the task that uh, Christ, his master, had entrusted to him. And um, ministers of the new covenant, now covenant is a will, uh, a legal contract, an agreement uh, that is binding on the uh, people within the covenant and the covenant he's referring here to is the new covenant uh, in the blood that is sealed with the blood of Christ, right? So our covenant uh, with God the Father through the blood of Christ. Um, and so this is a covenant that uh, they were ministers of. Uh, and this is a covenant not of the letter, that is not like the old covenant, which was uh, simply a set of rules, uh, but it is um, of the spirit. So this spirit that transforms the hearts of people, not the letter that kills, uh, meaning not the letter that gives you a set of rules that uh, you cannot follow, but of the spirit who gives life. So the spirit who transforms our hearts, enables us to live in obedience to uh, the will of God and through that to experience the life, the abundant life that comes through Christ. Um, so we see here um, the same uh, thing about the role of the law versus the spirit in the new covenant in Romans 7, 5 to 6. If someone can read that for us, please. Romans uh, chapter 7, verse 5 to 6. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passion which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Yes, yeah, so we see here uh, the same thing. The uh, that the law was uh, something that we were trying to uh, fulfill, or we're trying to live in accordance with the law in our own strength, in our physical uh, ability, uh, in our own flesh. We were trying to uh, live in accordance with the righteous law of God, and. Uh, we obviously failed because we could not meet God's standards. And because we couldn't meet God's standards, uh, that would lead to death for us. Uh, but because of this new covenant, uh, we no longer have to live uh, 
in the power of our own flesh, but we live in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit enables us to live a life that is pleasing to God, um, and therefore to have life in Christ. So from there we go into verses 7 to 18. Uh, here we see Paul uh, just contrasting these two covenants. So uh, talking about uh, the old covenant having uh, glory that was limited versus the new covenant that is much more glorious. Uh, again here, uh, continuing to uh, tell them uh tell them to value uh what what god has entrusted to paul uh as a minister to them and so to recognize that this was something uh, glorious that god himself had uh, chosen Paul to carry to the church. So, but if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadily look at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. So this is from Exodus 34, 29. Maybe we can just read that uh, account, uh, Exodus 34, 29 to 33. Actually, you can read from 29 to 35. Uh, from verse 29, 34, 29. Exodus chapter 34, verse 29. Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come near him. Then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the children of Israel came near, and he gave them as commandments all the all that the Lord has spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And he would come out and speak to the children of Israel, whatever he had been commanded. And whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, and that the skin of Moses' face shone, then Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. Uh, so we see this account of the uh, when Moses received uh, the tablets of stone with uh, the old covenant with the law that uh, God had given, uh, and um, so Paul is talking about this specific uh, these specific verses in the Old Testament that talks about that uh, radiance on Moses's face whenever he was meeting with God, uh, that that radiance could be seen on his face, that glory could be seen on his face. Uh, so he's saying here, um, there that glory was a temporary glory because we see that uh, after some time it would fade away, right? So uh, he would come immediately after meeting with God, his face would be radiant and then it would fade over time. And then when he went back and met with God again, he would come back with uh, that radiance. Uh, so that was a glory that was passing away. But um, but this ministry of the Spirit is a glory uh, that will remain for eternity. And so how much more glorious then is this ministry of the Spirit versus that ministry of the Old Covenant? Um, and then in verse 9, for the ministry of condemnation had glory, 
the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. So another contrast uh, where that one was a one of condemnation. Uh, it it showed the people how sinful they were. It didn't give them a way to be saved. It only exposed that uh, they were in a place of sin. They were in a place of condemnation. Uh, whereas the new covenant um, was a covenant of salvation. It exposed the sins of people and gave people a way to be saved through Jesus. Um, and Jesus paid the price for that, for our salvation. And so, uh, contrasting the condemnation versus the righteousness that uh, here we were condemned, here we are made righteous. In the new covenant, we are made righteous. Um, in verse 10, for even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. So uh, he's saying that old covenant actually has no glory. Now, when you look at this new covenant, this old covenant can't even be talked about as glorious because this glory is so great it eclipses anything that was in the old testament or in the old covenant uh, verse 12 therefore since we have such hope we use great boldness of speech unlike moses who put a veil over his face so that the children of israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away but their minds were blinded so uh, moses covered his face uh, as he was uh, engaging with the people. On the other hand, Paul could stand boldly and proclaim the gospel uh, because of how great the gospel is. Uh, so he's using, um, now we know that Moses was not covering his face because of any sense of shame or uh, anything of that sort. But Paul is using that as an image, that that veil uh, was um, was a picture of it being something less than versus we can stand boldly in front of you without any covering, without having to shield ourselves in any way. Uh, we can proclaim the gospel to you. And uh, then he also uses that veil to talk about the blinding of the people. So um, the people who are still living with uh, the old covenant, their eyes are blinded. So um, the, those who had not received Christ, uh, those who had not responded to the gospel, had been blinded. Um, and that veil that was covering Moses' face is like a veil that covers their eyes, that they're unable to see the truth of who Jesus is. But it is in the new covenant that Christ takes away that veil and opens our spiritual eyes to reveal to us uh, that salvation is in him, to reveal to us uh, what it means to be a covenant people, truly uh, a people in covenant, a people made righteous, uh, a people who stand uh, before God uh, as his people. And so all of the things that the Old Testament talked about but didn't fulfill now in Christ uh, is is brought to reality. And so that veil is taken away, that um, spiritual blindness is taken away in Christ. And then verse 15. Um, okay, verse 15 is saying a little more about that. Um, verse 17, so now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So, um, so he says, uh, this is where true liberty is, where true freedom is, is in the Holy Spirit. Uh, and when we experience that freedom from sin, uh, freedom from being enslaved, uh, and we're able to walk in righteousness, we're able to walk in holiness, that's where our liberty is. Um, and in this liberty, we can gaze on on Christ. We can look at Christ and it's like we are looking in a mirror 
And as we are gazing at Christ, we become more and more like him. We become more and more glorious. Um, and that is the work of the Holy Spirit in us. So we uh, keep our eyes fixed on Christ. Uh, we are constantly allowing uh, ourselves to be transformed into his image, into his likeness, uh, doing that as we surrender more and more through the Holy Spirit's work in us. Um, and so this is also a, a beautiful thing that it's not only a covenant that is more glorious, but that we are a people who carry that glory. Uh, so the, the Old Testament uh, had some glory and Moses was a carrier of some of that glory. But now each of us as believers become carriers of this greater glory and we are go growing from glory to glory as we allow the Holy Spirit to transform us, as we uh, continue to fix our eyes on Christ, continue to gaze upon him and allow him to uh, make us more like him. So we can... Uh, move from there to the next chapter, okay. chapter four. Um, I think this is also a short chapter, so if somebody can read that for us, chapter four. Chapter four, the light of Christ's gospel. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your born servants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always caring about in in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body for for we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus sake that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh so then death is working in us but life in you and since we have the same spirit of faith According to what is written, I, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are, are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For a light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Amen. Thank you. So uh, here we see um, Paul moving from this uh, 
talking about the two covenants, contrasting them, talking about uh, the fact that uh, this covenant that they brought was a covenant that was so glorious. And so God had entrusted that uh, ministry to Paul. Uh, now he talks about um, this other side of um, of the sacrifice that is involved in this gospel, uh, the things that uh, they have suffered, the things that they have gone through, um, because they know that glory is not for this present day. So even if uh, the church is looking for a leader who is uh, who is um, someone who is impressive or someone who uh, in some way matches uh, their idea of what is great, what is uh, something for them to boast in, uh, he says that is not what we are looking at. We are not looking at what is uh, what is considered glorious in the present? We are looking at a future glory, and uh, so he talk he talks more about that uh, through this chapter, uh, verses uh, from verse one onwards. Uh, Since we have this ministry, we as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart, um, and so it's recognizing that this ministry is given to them through the mercy of God. Uh, and uh, because it's given through the mercy of God, uh, whatever challenges they face um, and whatever comes against them in whatever way, whether it is from outside the church or within the church, they do not lose heart uh, because it is that recognition of God's goodness to them, God's uh, compassion towards them uh, that is undeserved. Uh, God entrusting them with this ministry uh, just out of his own kindness towards them. Um, that is what encourages them. That's what keeps them going, even in the face of challenges. This is something uh, that is so important for us as uh, people who may be ministering in different contexts, um, whether it's in a full-time context or uh, voluntarily, whatever it is, challenges are a normal part of ministry. Uh, there will be people who question the things we do, people who don't like the way we're doing things, uh, people who think someone else may be a better leader, whatever uh, those challenges are, sometimes from the, the people, the very people we're leading. Uh, it's different when it's someone from the outside who you're not ministering to. Um, you don't, you may not be as hurt by uh, a challenge that comes from the outside. But when it is the very people that you are making sacrifices for, uh, when it's those people for whom you're pouring out your life, you're uh, doing all of these things to see them grow, to bless them, and then you see uh, them question you or them to uh, in some way not uh, not recognize what you are doing for them, uh, then it's so easy to become discouraged, to feel like our work is hopeless or our work is um, not being uh, not really uh, useful in any way. Uh, in these times, it is so important to be strengthened by the Lord, uh, to remember it is the Lord who has called us. It's the Lord who's entrusted this ministry to us. Uh, it's the Lord who has, uh, in his compassion, in his great mercy towards us and towards the people we are serving, he has given us this ministry and entrusted to us. And that um, should be what keeps us going, even when outside circumstances are not encouraging us uh, to be encouraged in the spirit through uh, that confidence that we have in Christ and that gratitude that we have for what he has entrusted to us. Uh, so verse 2, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So he says, uh, we have done this without in any way trying to deceive people. So we have not tried to uh, trap you 
we've not tried to uh, adulterate or uh, give you something that is impure, something that is incorrect, something that is wrong. Uh, we've not tried in any way to uh, to deceive you. Uh, rather, we have brought to you the truth, uh, the plain truth. Right? We've been honest before you. We've presented the gospel to you. Um, and this itself uh, should be proof to you that we can be trusted. So the fact that we didn't come with any ulterior motive in the way we presented the gospel, uh, we didn't in any way choose any cunning way, any way to uh, take your money, nothing like that. We just came with the pure gospel. Uh, and by seeing the way we did it, the way we presented the truth to you, that um, should should prove our character and our hearts uh, to you. So we'll stop here. We'll take a 10 minute break and be back um, and kind of continue from there. Thank you. <laughs>